Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. John Hamry, the President and CEO of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, I want to thank you for coming to this uh, latest in our Ground Forces Dialogue. I'm David Berto. I'm the Director of the International Security Program and an occasional aide to the uh, uh, Ground Forces Dialogue Program. Um, Ground Forces Dialogue is actually uh, uh, under the purview of the Harold Brown Chair at CSIS, and it's under the direction of Dr. Maren Lead. Most of you know uh, her. She's here today and will be our questioner uh, and our, our conduit for questions as we get to the end of the process. But the Ground Forces Dialogue, which was begun earlier this year at CSIS, is really a broad uh, set of discussions and on the record discussions looking at a host of issues associated with U.S. Ground Forces, not just uh, Army Ground Forces, but across the spectrum, if you will. Inside that, obviously, one of the big issues has to do with the industrial base that both supports and, uh, and is supported by. Uh, ground forces. This whole series of dialogues, including today's session, is made possible by generous support from both Northrop Grumman Corporation and BAE Systems, uh, and so we're grateful for that support. Um, and I think if I could see past the lights, I would see that there are a couple of representatives from those companies in the audience today. Um, we're really pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Brett Lambert. Actually, I just promoted you, right? I gave you a PhD, Anytime. yes, honorary PhD from the uh, Pentagon. Um, <laughs> the, the process, <laughs> that, that'll get you a long lot. way that'll from the state lot, school yes. in Kansas. Believe this me. is a new way of absolving post-employment restrictions <laughs> is to grant an, an honorary doctorate along the way as a part right. of your service. <laughs> um, the process that we have laid out here this morning or this afternoon is uh, Brett will uh, lay out a few thoughts of his own, and he's got a handout that he'll refer to that you can use uh, to go back and flip back and forth. Um, then I'll have a short dialogue with him here in which I get to ask him uh, a couple of easy questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor for hard questions. Each of you should have picked up a note card or a set of note cards, depending on how prolific you're feeling today, and you can write down your questions on that. You raise your card when you're ready, and, and we've got folks who will pick them up, and uh, 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 Marn Lead will collect them and will we'll aggregate them into a series of, of sequential and uh, coherent questions and fire them at Brett. So I'm going to do the easy ones. You get to do the hard ones, and, uh, and we'll call time when you're, when you're done. We've got about an hour set aside for this, so we should be Let's able to the get easy to, ones up to, almost, to <laughs> almost everything. So um, also, if I could remind you, in fact, I'm going to do this myself, to silence your cell phones. They probably don't penetrate. But on the rare momentary occasion where they might, actually, it looks like I've got more um, here. signal here than I expected, although it's on a network I don't recognize. Um, so, so much for, <laughs> so much I, for I, cybersecurity. I might know what that network is. <laughs> um, and I actually have two of these, so I have to do this twice to make sure that I don't interrupt us with a phone call along the way. So with that, um, I want to welcome Brett Lambert. Brett is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Manufacturing and Industrial Base Policy. That's a, pr a broader portfolio than it was when you arrived and one that was broadened considerably by the President in his budget announcement uh, of two weeks ago. Um, prior to his service at the Pentagon, he has a long career in the financial industry, focusing both on defense and on much broader issues uh, going back to his early days at, at DRI. He also, in, in full disclosure, I should mention, did have a a modest affiliation with CSIS at a number of steps along the way. So I guess in some ways we're culpable or maybe even uh, responsible for, for some of the benefits that you brought to the department. But he has been for the last four and a half years really the single focus and face of the Defense Department on industrial based policy issues across the board from the most narrow and, and specific questions to the broader issues. And we've been delighted that he's been there and are glad to welcome him here this afternoon to talk to us. Brett, welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it, it's as, as David said, my roots were actually were in CSIS. I'm not c quite sure what it says about CSIS, but they were the uh, uh, one of there were only two people that offered me an internship when I was a freshman at Kansas State. One was Bob Dole, and he kind of had to, uh, <laughs> and uh, and the other one was CSIS. So I have a long uh, and deep appreciation for them. It, uh, it whetted my appetite uh, for work in Washington. So I thought I'd just spend a little bit of time today talking about how we view the overall industrial base, why we, why we uh, uh, feel it's important in the department. And as, as, as David said, over the last few years, we, it, it, it has become much more uh, important as we, as we continue this, uh, uh, this cycle that we're currently in. 
an accelerated cycle uh, to, to be sure, but uh, the cycle that we're in. And then specifically talk about the, uh, the work we've been doing in ground vehicles, and that's some of the, um, the handouts. And I, I, it's unfortunate that I can't give you the specifics, but I tried to at least give you an, uh, an understanding of these handouts, and we'll go through them quickly uh, of what we're trying to do uh, in the department. I should say when I first came in, uh, industrial base was not uh, a major concern of the department. And that truly was not a political issue. I, I, I believe that with all my heart. It wasn't because the previous administration didn't care, it's because they didn't have to. We had double digit year over year growth. Uh, we were, uh, there was really no need in many cases to have a dialogue uh, with industry about anything other than capacity. How can you increase capacity to serve the warfighter? Cost was a secondary issue. Uh, efficiency was a secondary issue, and, and frankly, rightfully so. We had men and women in the field, and it made sense for everyone to surge, uh, both on the industry side and on the department side. So when, when I came in, Secretary Gates and then Deputy Secretary Lynn said, look, this isn't going to last forever. And we need to start thinking through with our industrial partners, because despite the fact we spend over a billion dollars a day, as I've said over and over again, we don't build a damn thing. Uh, the industry does. Industry builds everything from ships to shoestrings for us. So we have to start working with industry to understand the implications of this surge and of the capacity that we're dealing with now, and it's particularly pronounced in the, in the, uh, in the ground vehicles market, but of the capacity that we have accommodated in order to meet the warfighters' needs. So they ask, uh, I was asked, uh, my office was asked to go back and look at the four, first of all, look at the four previous downturns uh, after World War II, after Korea, uh, after Vietnam and then again in the, after the Cold War, but really the last one was uh, uh, more closer to what we experience today in terms of it was, it was motivated by financial issues, uh, national uh, economic issues, but then accelerated by the collapse of the wall. And then look at how we responded and how industry responded uh, to each of those downturns and how it affected our warfighters. And, uh, and, and so we did this. Uh, analysis, I, I, I worked on it just as I would approach it from an industry side and any strategic planning exercise. Unfortunately, the answers we got back when we looked hard at it was we were in essence zero for four. We had gotten it wrong every time. Uh, sometimes we got it wrong because we, we weren't balanced in the reductions. Uh, we hollowed out the force uh, and that's particularly uh, uh, true after World War II and the lead up to Korea and that had the result of not just being uh, having us be uh, more ineffectual than we would otherwise uh, want to be, but it actually ended up uh, costing a lot of lives, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, soldiers and sailors and women's lives. Uh, and sometimes we got it wrong because the threat fundamentally changed, and we didn't have an, an industrial capacity that could uh, respond uh, effectively to that changing threat. And the other thing that was fundamentally different about this, this downturn is that everyone, you know, people will say, and I've, I've heard the arguments actually in CSIS forums, that you know, our, the downturn we're now experiencing is not that different than what happened after, uh, after the Cold War a, a, as we drew down. Well, there's a couple of fundamental different uh, aspects. One is that the threat uh, has not changed. In fact, it's actually increased. Uh, and the second biggest thing for the industrial perspective is that our equipment is, is, has been road hard and put up wet. It, it is old. And after the Cold War, if you recall, we had bright, shiny new things from airplanes uh, to tanks to ground vehicles, to missiles, and we weren't in the situation that we currently are in where we have to look at recapitalization and refurbishment. So there, you know, comparing those two, if you're just looking at a percentage decrease, I think is a mistake because it, you have to look at both the threat and the capacity uh, within, within the base. So with that, we were asked to go back and say, okay, well, our, our, our base is different than any of these four uh, previous downturns, and they asked me to define that. And so our office uh, worked hard to try to articulate what was different about the base now than it was, uh, uh, than it was even 20 years ago. And fundamentally, the, the tagline, the bumper sticker we've, we, we, we've, we've said, and there's a lot of data behind it, but in essence, the base is more global, it's much more commercial, and it's incredibly financially complex. And those were, though it is, that is truer today, the statement I said, than when we came up with that tagline, it'll be truer tomorrow. We are dependent on a global supply chain, uh, even at the second, third, and fourth tiers. Uh, they are dependent on a global supply chain, particularly as it relates to IT uh, uh, capabilities uh, and, 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 uh, and, and 
silicon-based uh, capabilities. It is much more commercial. Uh, we have a lot of uh, firms that, uh, frankly, when we do these analyses, and I'll talk about some of them in a second, don't even know that they're supplying the Department of Defense. <laughs> Uh, yet, if they go out of business, we can't build what we need to build for the warfighter. And it's more financially complex. And I put a great deal of emphasis, those of you who have heard me speak about this before, uh, access to capital on a competitive basis is absolutely essential for our industrial capacity and our industrial base. And the, the ability for defense firms and, 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 and commercial firms that wish to supply us uh, with cutting edge technology, we cannot uh, forget how important access to capital is, again, on a competitive basis. And that has to do with our profit policies, our uh, reimbursement policies. Our, it goes to the heart of what we rolled out yesterday, Dr. Uh, Mr. Kendall did in Better Buying Power 2.0. It goes to the heart of being more efficient but being fair uh, with industries to ensure that they have the access uh, to capital that they need to be uh, competitive for us uh, in, in the global marketplace. So. With that in mind, then we, we, so we had this change. We also had another fundamental change was about 10 years ago when we looked at the numbers, about 70 cents of every dollar that we gave a prime contractor stayed at the prime. Uh, so we would provide to one, whatever, pick your top 10 company, it would stay there, uh, sometimes through subsidiaries. Some the, it is completely flipped now. Uh, and we have a couple of case examples, but in general, 65 to 70 cents of every dollar that we give to a prime in a prime award flows out of that prime within 30 days. And it flows down to a, a, a completely different set of uh, structure than we have traditionally thought about the industrial base. And so I've actually made a point over the last year or so of, of not referring to the industrial base, because it's kind of a meaningless term these days. I talk about industrial capacity. What kind of capacity does the nation need to provide for the warfighter at a fair price for the taxpayer? I think it's an important differentiation because it's much more complex and much more nuanced. And so having companies that are capable of performing at that lower fourth and fifth tier and flow up to what in essence has become system, systems integrators uh, as opposed to manufacturers in some cases, uh, is a very important distinction for all of us to understand as we're trying to provide the warfighter uh, with the uh, equipment that they need uh, to perform their, their missions. So with that, uh, understanding all of these kind of uh, parameters of the general debate, I was, uh, our office was asked to conduct a, a, a brand new, frankly, assessment uh, of, the, of the industrial base. What's it look like? Uh, as Dr. Carter said at the time to, you know, don't, don't tell me what the cells look like, but I'd like to see the muscle structure and the bone structure, give me the general anatomy of it. And we set out on something called S2T2, which was the sector by sector, tier by tier, which was to look across the sectors, and they're defined by the normal budgetary uh, terms of how we define them, so aircraft, missiles, we threw in uh, UAVs, we threw in cyber, um, and then look down through those tiers. What's the structure of that base look like? and understand the interrelationships uh, between both the sectors, but also between the tiers, understand the codependencies. And, and, and if my goal in all of this when we started this was, I said the department really needs to get out of the lifeguard business, which is where you have a, a critical sub-tier supplier, uh, say in, in Ground Vehicles, and we have a couple of examples there, uh, that all of a sudden one day you wake up and they're out of business, they've shut down. Uh, and so it was the lifeguard business that somebody would raise their hand, they were drowning, and we would jump in. And, and how, how could we step back from that process and understand the base to the extent where we could get early indicators, early warning indicators, and if necessary, intervene. But not just intervention, but look for alternatives. And those alternatives could be domestic, they could be global, they, it depends on the, the circumstance. Or look for the uh, vehicles that we had in place in the department that could aid that company uh, in particular or the sub sub-supplier uh, to come up with a new product or a new service or a new capability uh, and, and continue to be economically viable and fulfill the, the requirements of the department. And that was, in essence, the sector by sector, tier by tier uh, effort that was kicked off. It was not a study, and there's a, some misconception there. It's not a study. It is a continuing effort, kind of like better buying power. There's a 1.0. There was just now, yesterday, a 2.0. There's going to be a 3.0 and a 4.0. S2T2 is exactly in that same vein. We, it's a continuous product improvement of understanding what the base is and understanding the interrelationships uh, that the base has. And so 
that was not an easy, as you can imagine, everyone who has worked with in this sector for a long time, that's not an easy thing to do uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the services don't necessarily like to share information, uh, as many of you in this room know. They don't even like to share it with us. Uh, um, so there's a, there's a roadblock. There's, there was a hurdle to overcome there. We had to prove that there, this was a benefit to the services. Uh, this effort was a benefit to the services. Companies don't necessarily want to share their supplier chain, not, not even with their own suppliers in many cases if they're primes. And I understand that. It's, it, it is a competitive differentiator, and you have to be careful about how you manage that, those relationships. Um, so getting to that level of specificity and detail that was, that was useful was not an easy undertaking. In fact, it's been about three years, and we're just now starting to see the results of a, cons uh, of a very concentrated three-year effort. I have a couple people here from my office, Sid Pope, particularly on the, gr on the ground system side, who has had to live through not only the challenges of, of interacting with industry, but interacting with our own department uh, to try to obtain the information that we need to make the changes that we need to make sure we can support the warfighter going forward. Uh, and that, has, that effort, as now, I can assure you, is inculcated throughout the department. Uh, for the first time, when I first got in, uh, AT&L was asked, for the first time ever, uh, uh, to participate in the QDR. And we, we talked about the importance of the manufacturing industrial base in the QDR. Uh, it was in our strategic guidance uh, document. You will see it uh, in the new documents that, are, that will be coming out in, uh, by the end of May, early June about the importance uh, of, a, of a viable, financially healthy uh, industrial base. So it's one thing to have the words, it's another thing to actually, uh, impl actually implement what we're trying to do. So for the arcane in the audience, there's this 5062 series that's going through. Every major program review will now involve a review of the impact of the programmatic decisions on the industrial base. And this is new. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not been an easy sell, but it's been one that's important. And I have incredible support from the secretary uh, to Dr. Carter to Mr. Kendall on down to make sure that we are considering the implications of our decisions on the industrial base. Because again, at the end of the day, we don't build anything. And we have to be cognizant of that. Um, so with that, it, I, I don't know if you want to walk through the, this is part of our uh, cost conscious uh, savings. We're, we have little uh, handouts. And I, I won't walk through each one of them. But I'll just give you a sense of what we're doing uh, it, it, here. The first example of the survey, and again, S2TT isn't just about surveys. We have a lot of independent experts. A lot of industry has helped us with this. This is an example, and it happens to be a ground vehicle example. Uh, the, the centers of gravity that you see there are two major companies. Uh, I won't say who they are, but it can't be too hard to figure out uh, <laughs> who the two major companies are. And these are the interrelationships that occur between their contracting base. And so what you see on the left is um, a great deal of, of connectivity down to the second, third, and in this case, even the 10th tier. Uh, and on the right, uh, you see an example of where that probably would be more robust, as Sid pointed out, but we've had a difficult time getting the information, frankly, from the prime uh, contractor in this case. But then what information we have gotten from over the uh, last uh, uh, year or so the green above are their common suppliers, are people that are uh, supplying to both. So as you have changes or fluctuations in, in, in product uh, from one, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the sub-tier all the way down is, is going to go out of business. It could mean that you just need to balance it. And I can give you no better example because I, it's public, and a lot of them we can't talk about. But this one I can because we made it public before. We had a case uh, in the solid rocket motor industry uh, where we, we rely on solid rockets for all of our strategic and all of our tactical systems, from the Zumi to the D5 to the Minuteman. Uh, NASA was the largest provider uh, or largest consumer of solid rockets. The, uh, the shuttle market made up about 70% of the solid rocket motor business. Uh, we're not used to being the tail uh, in any market. And when, when NASA terminated shuttle, uh, nobody really talked to the department about what the implications would be of that. But in essence, somebody shot our dog. And, uh, and we had to quickly regroup and say, hey, look, 70% of the market just went away. So you immediately go to the two prime contractors who make solid rockets, which is an important thing to do. But more important in my mind was what, what suppliers did they rely on? 
And, and at the end of the day, there was one remaining supplier of ammonium perchlorite in the United States. Two other suppliers in the world, one in Paris and one in Beijing. But only one that was qualified to work for both our strategic and our tactical systems. They had a minimum requirement of about three and a half, four million pounds of perchlorite a year. Otherwise, it wasn't economically feasible for them to stay in business and they would just shut down. We weren't the key driver in their market. They would just shut down, which means we would not have a provider of ammonium perchlorite, which means we could not produce solid rockets without requalifying either the French source, which I would guess is, is difficult to do uh, given our strategic uh, systems, uh, or figuring out a way to balance the load between the Navy, the Air Force, uh, the Marines, uh, and, and the Army in their buy of uh, solid rocket motor uh, uh, systems that would balance that out so we could get to a minimum sustainment rate uh, that would help this company, and while also investing in this company, to uh, go to the next generation and looking for alternatives. And we did that, but it was very difficult to do. Uh, in one case, we had to get the Army uh, because they were being pressed to save money so they could source to, to Europe. That would have been fine. But their sourcing to Europe would have had the result of dropping us behind that minimum threshold. And it would have affected the other services and all the other programs. So I guess the point of this is that these are in incredibly interrelated uh, decisions that we have to make, and they have to be part of our budget process. As we make programmatic decisions, we have to understand the implications that those programs have, not just on the primes, but on the second, uh, third, and all the way down to the, uh, the tenth tiers. So to do that, the next slide is we've created a, uh, an assessment tool, which is called the cr Criticality and Fragility Assessment Tool. And this is what every major program officer is being trained on that will go through. Uh, and they will evaluate, uh, uh, on, and it is a qualitative scale. I don't mean to uh, put more science into this than it is. But it gives them a cognizant uh, understanding of what their industrial base, particularly at the subcomponent levels, are. These are the ratings um, that we've asked them to make. And again, there's a desk book for that. And then the, uh, the third one just gives you a demonstration of the solid rocket uh, one. We, for criticality, it's how critical is that particular component or industrial base capability, how critical it is to that system. And again, we're looking at the sub-tiers sub way, way down below, and we weight them differently. And on the fragility analysis, it's how, how much trouble is this company in? Uh, do they have a good balance sheet? Uh, are, they, do they, are they commercially diverse? Is this their only thing that they're doing? And so that's, that varies tremendously across our sectors. Uh, so you, as you can imagine, there aren't that many uh, uh, commercial opportunities for people that make uh, nuclear submarine pumps. Uh, so that's one that we want to watch very carefully. Uh, but commercial uh, vessel uh, pumps and, and, and Belgians, things that are in the Navy, then maybe that one isn't as, as fragile or as critical uh, to our base as we can. So these lead us to really tough decisions. When we plot them out, and this, this the, the, the next one, uh, I guess five, is an actual plot. What I'd like to do, what we're trying to institute over time is every six months, every time there's a program review or a major milestone review, we want to track this and see who's trending right and who's trending left. Uh, are, 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 is our base getting more healthy or is it getting more endangered? And then when we do see uh, trouble spots uh, cropping up in the base, there's a whole variety of options we have. We work with the prime contractors. We have options and authorities that I know we'll talk about uh, uh, to intervene, but only at, as really the last resort if there are critical capabilities. But the fact is we can't intervene if we don't know what we need to do. And this gets to my, particularly in the armored uh, or in the vehicle section, is uh, the mantra that I've started to use over and over again, which is we have to stop solving million dollar problems with billion dollar solutions. Uh, if, beca because this data has never been collected, because we haven't done it comprehensively in the past, what has happened is that we tend to just continue to build the things because we know building things keeps the supply base alive. And I would do that if we can. We can't. We are out of money. I can't build a new factory until I close an old one. It's a zero-sum game. So we have to really understand at the very core level what are the critical components, what are the critical capabilities, what are the critical engineering skills, uh, what are the critical industrial capacity elements that make up the system of the future not the system that we've become accustomed to over the last decade. And that's a big challenge for all of us. All right. That's a good, quick tour, Brett. I appreciate that. I have a couple of specific questions about S2T2 and the
criticality and fragility uh, assessment process, and then I have a couple of general questions, and then we'll, we'll open it up to the floor. So if you haven't written your questions down yet and handed them, uh, raise your hand for them, uh, you can, this would be a good time to do so. As you look at your data that you've collected here through the surveys and through the application the expertise, you know, information from the programs, information from the companies themselves, et cetera, um, one of the grave concerns that I would have is that this is, can tend to be kind of static if you're not careful. Right. You've got snapshots in time. They're very precise and comprehensive, but they erode quickly yes. and, and in some cases faster than others. How do you compensate for that and, and how do you build that into your process? Well, it, it, that's a great question because we went out Everyone, when they, we first tried to, to do the surveys, which I know, I don't know how many people in this room had to fill these out or had to see them. They're daunting. You know, it's one of those forms that comes to a company and, uh, uh, and it, it starts by saying this should take so many hours. And given having filled out many tax things, I know that whatever that number is, you triple it and you, you know, it's, it's, it, it was a daunting task for companies. We tried to work with the companies uh, through it to get the most interesting uh, bits out uh, of them and, and to assure them that it was protected and I understand this is highly proprietary. So we will be doing refresh and revisits and one of the things that I, having come from industry, most of the surveys that go on in the department go on by company. Well we all know in this room that this industry has changed so much, uh, mergers, acquisitions and I worked on a lot of them. So I didn't want to do it by company, I wanted to do it by facility. So that was a different approach that we took. We, we actually looked at the facility uh, instead of, in some cases that changes the cage code, but it was actually the physical address of these uh, capabilities. So we will, we will go out, uh, again this summer, we'll be going out and refreshing. And to lessen the burden on, uh, on industry, uh, the first tranche really was a burden, and I understand that. Uh, we will be uh, uh, looking at, uh, having uh, simpler, much simpler, or more simple uh, 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 surveys that say, if nothing's changed, check this box, and you don't have to fill it out again. But if something has changed, we'd like you to fill it out again. And we're going to do more sampling uh, as opposed to uh, vast surveys. We're also going to concentrate in different areas. A and uh, we've been working with DCMA. Uh, Charlie Williams has been particularly great because we, he asks a lot of questions. And then the, and then the ser services have a lot of these surveys. So we're trying to make sure that our office becomes a single repository for all this information and that we're able to share it so that industry doesn't get burdened over and over again with the same thing, uh, with the same questions over and over again. And, and uh, so far, I think industry has responded um, well, but we, if, if, you, if you are getting, if anyone out there is getting multiple requests for the same information, please let me know because that is something we can correct uh, and, and we're anxious to do it. We're just trying to get the data we don't want it to be an additional burden or, uh, or a cost for industry. So that's good in terms of, of the input. In terms of your use of it, as you look at critical and, and fragile, um, there are sub-elements of analysis that fold sure. into place here, and, and I want to probe on that a little bit, especially on the, on the criticality question, because uh, in, in my experience, a lot of times we tend to assume essential from a linear analysis point of view produces criticality from a vulnerability point of view or a right. consequence point of view. How do you bring vulnerability and, and ultimate consequences into play here in that assessment? Right, and, uh, and that is, and, we, and we, we're frankly, we're, we struggle with it because you, every, uh, every time you peel away a layer, you, you find another layer. And, and it, it, it's not just about being able to co uh, build the system that we have now or the system we're trying to build now, but it's about the capacity to build the next one. And so if you're a program manager and you're, you're giving us this data, there is nothing more important than, your, uh, than that particular program to you. But you have to see it in the broader context of what we're trying to build as a force structure. And that becomes a real challenge. And so there will be trades. There will, I mean, I, I, we should make no illusions. We will identify critical and key suppliers that will go under. Uh, because we will have made the assumption uh, uh, it, it based on our strategy moving forward that that is no longer a critical capability to our future force. Uh, and, and those are going to be hard decisions. And it's, uh, it, as we all know in this town, they're not decisions that are arrived at easily, uh, either politically or fiscally, uh, but those are decisions we're going to have to make. So once we do build it up from the program perspective uh, on the critical elements, the critical suppliers, our office is then asked to look across the, the, uh, the department, 
and across all the programs and try to marry all of that together to identify where are there unique, particularly unique to defense, uh, 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 horseshoes uh, or horse nails, if you will, uh, in, in that supply chain. But that, that's a, it's a real challenge and, it, and unfortunately there, there's going to be a lot of bad news that's given out uh, to companies because just because you're uh, vital to one program or one capability, we may have alternatives. Uh, we may want to invest in the next generation technology, or there may very well be the decision that we can't afford uh, uh, to support that particular effort, and we look for asymmetrical competition. And obviously that's where the consequences and the, yeah. the trade-offs come into play here. Yeah. Ultimately, this whole process is, is really about the department having the capability to identify risk in the industrial base, to assess the consequences of that risk uh, fairly, and then to manage or, or mitigate that risk over time. In order to do that kind of identification and assessment and management process, or set of processes, if you will, you rely on a host of statutory authorities and internal regulatory authorities, DOD directives, FAR clauses, uh, uh, Commerce Department authorities, et cetera. You've been in the job long enough now that you may be able to answer this question. Do you have in your position the authorities you need across the spectrum to be able to conduct this identification and assessment and risk management process? Yeah, I, I, I really, I'm comfortable with the authorities we have. We, we, we have to, I think it's more important that we have to demonstrate the value. That, I mean, they're, they're, as you said, I've been there long enough to know that we, we start a lot of things in the department. Right. Uh, that three months uh, after we start them, I look back and say, why are we even doing it? This is, doesn't make any sense. So I think it, the, my challenge is primarily to ensure that there's a relevant output, that we are affecting an outcome in all of these deliberations, and that it is contributing to the benefit uh, of the department over the long run, not just doing it for doing its sake. And so we have authorities, we have, we have the ability to intervene. Congress has been, frankly, quite helpful uh, uh, in, in many ways, every time we go up there and we explain what, what the situation is, we, we have found support uh, for things like the Industrial Base Investment Fund, which they funded uh, this year. This, these are small amounts of dollars, but they're really a, a capacity for us once we identify a, a, a problem, we can bridge that problem with some funding until the services can come back online and take it over. Uh, we have DPA authorities, Defense Production Act authorities uh, for manufacturing. We have the Mantech programs. All of those, basically Title I, III, and Seven now are all under the purview of, of, of uh, the organization I represent. And that's been a good balance. We, we usually can find, if we can identify the problem, we can usually identify the solution. Our problem has been understanding what the real element of the problem is. Let me ask one more question, and then I'll turn over to Dr. Lead, who has a fistful there uh, <laughs> that have been rolling in here. Um, uh, so we've spent a lot of time talking about what we do in the diminishing end, where you've got a critical source and they're threatened or at risk and got a business, et cetera. There are other problems in the industrial base as well, which particularly in an era of declining budgets tend to reflect itself in the form of excess capacity. Right. And, uh, and particularly in some ground forces uh, uh, systems and, uh, and, and uh, 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 track vehicles, for instance, et cetera, uh, there at least is the appearance of uh, excess capacity today. How do you take this same approach or do you take a different approach to dealing with the question of uh, rationalizing excess capacity because that's a different level of risk. That's a risk of wasting money. Right, and this is, and we have, when I started uh, doing this, I was shocked because I, again, coming from the financial community when doing transactions, we always used to look at the utilization rates and so forth of, of factories. We, we, had, we had factories, even, even back when I st uh, started in this job, that were operating at seven, eight percent capacity. Uh, and again, the, the industry reflects the department, and so I, I kind of have to walk this fine line because I understand what industry is doing. They're building capacity to meet our demands. Uh, and you, you know, industry would have been in a hard place if we weren't able to meet the demands. And of course, if there's money, you want to meet the demands. But now we are in a situation where uh, we have a tremendous amount of excess capacity across all sectors, but particularly in this sector, and we have to start rationalizing. But we have to do it in a, in a, in a manageable and logical way. And not to put too fine a point on it, but I, I have said in senior meetings that you just can't, you know, it's like having a, a, a kid that for 10 years you gave nothing but donuts and then you woke up one day and you said, hey, this kid's really big. I'm not gonna feed him again until they get small. It, it, it's not how industry works. <laughs> industry surged 
because we asked them to surge. And now we have to deliver on our promise to have a robust industrial capability, but we have to do it in a manageable way. And I think we were well on our way to doing that with the budgets we had put in place with some of these efforts. As I said, we were, we were on our way to for an escalator down for our industrial base. Industry understood this. Um, uh, but then, you know, BCA hit, and then, okay, so now it's an elevator down. And then sequestration hits, and it's really an elevator, but frankly, just the shaft for industry. I mean, it just <laughs> drops off like a cliff. So we're trying to manage our way through that just as industry's trying to manage. It's just a bad way to do business. And so what I've been promoting, it, both in the department and every time I have a chance to say it on the Hill, is make it bigger, make it smaller, just please make it predictable. We can manage the predictability, but you've got to get us some stability in the industrial base. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to have the innovative third and fourth tiers that want to play. And in fact, I will not be surprised, I, uh, and I, I think this will happen, uh, certainly on my watch in the next uh, m few months, where you have people that just say, I'm not going to do this anymore. It's, it's uh, you know, we've had the benefit in the industrial base so far of companies uh, viewing this as a growth strategy. And I think the way we have behaved in our budget environment right now for companies that aren't all in, that aren't our pure primes, defense is becoming a hedge strategy. And a hedge strategy is not where you want to be in industry because the returns have to be a lot greater than we're going to be able to provide. And so I worry about that balance moving forward. One thing that is predictable is that this collective group of people can come up with a lot better questions than I can. So let me turn the floor over to Dr. Lead and you can lead off with, uh, with some of these. Um, Brett, thanks so much for coming sure. and doing this. There are a number of people who have actually wrote, written very nice things to you personally on their cards, and so I'll just hand those to you. Oh, nice, good, good. Which is something I've never seen <laughs> at a CSIS event. I know it was a bring your daughter to so, work day, but uh, I don't see her out here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, you can just reflect on those later tonight. But um, there, are a, there are a number of different questions here about um, not just the purely private component of this, but what's the role of the depots, what's the role of the GOCO sure. facilities, particularly with things like Better Buying two, uh, Power 2.0, how do you manage profits in, in, the, in that context and the public-private component of this? Right. So you, you're going to start with the easy questions, though, I thought. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's a reality uh, that we all, all deal with. We have, we, we have a requirement uh, that we fully intend to to honor on a, on a commitment for hep to have an organic capability. And I think as we enter this transition, particularly in this sector, uh, where we're moving more from production to sustainment in terms of the total number of, of bases, that the differentiation that we'll have to concentrate on is, is, is making sure that our organic capability is robust, but not competitive uh, in a sense that hurts the non-organic capability, the, the industrial base, and that's going to be a fine line. This issue, as everyone in this room is well aware, has largely gone away over the last decade, and it's about ready to come back real fast. Uh, but I think it's, a, it's going to be a challenge, but I think at the end of the day, if, if there's an understanding that we do want and are required to have an organic capability, what we want to make sure is that that organic capability is robust, but at the same time not competitive. Uh, with the private sector and what we're asking the private sector to do, these are very different uh, lines and we need, to, we need to be as clear as possible to both our organic base and the private sector of what we're trying to do uh, with each of them. Good afternoon, sir. Steve Nicolucci, I'm one of the military yep. fellows here. A rather straightforward one here. What is the impact of our export control restrictions on the industrial base? Well, the, uh, it, I don't know even where to start there. We do so many stupid things. It's <laughs> unbelievable. Um, uh, it, it's a huge contributor to our overall economic well-being. And so I can make the economic arguments forever, and we have on, on the Hill and, and, and even in the White House, and everyone buys into that. And yet, despite what we say, we continue to, uh, to really, you know, we, we, with exports, we, we shoot ourselves in the foot, we become non-competitive, and then we examine it, we do a study, we hire somebody to do a study for us, we reload, and then we shoot ourselves in the other foot. Um, uh, and we don't seem to make much progress. I will say this administration has made a tremendous amount of progress on the exportability 
of items. Everything from what we're doing now to build in exportability, which is a big initiative of Mr. Kindle's uh, and the White House through these pilot programs, but also understanding the importance of exports for bridging uh, uh, production gaps. Uh, so when I look at, so those are two different things. One is to increase our capacity for competitiveness, lower our overhead rates. Uh, for, for the exports, but I also look at gaps we have in productions, particularly in this sector, and how can we move uh, production for, ex for exports to the left. Now the problem we have is if we start gapping a lot of systems, if we start terminating systems, countries won't believe us that we're going to be able to sustain uh, the capability or the companies will be able to. So, so there's a, a, a bit of an understanding that it's not just the foreign sales, that we have to be in it for the long haul. We have to be able to sustain that, that capability and that product over time. Uh, and the other thing, I would, so I think we're getting better at that, but the other thing that has really changed, and this is really in the last 24 months, is the department is an advocate. Uh, and you've seen it in some of uh, Mr. Kindle's documents, you've certainly seen it in some of the letters Mr. Uh, Dr. Carter has written. We are becoming much more like every other country, we are slow to the game, at advocating our, our systems overseas and doing it from a, a political uh, level. And that has made a difference, and we, we can already tell it. And we have a few high profile uh, cases right now where you have senior U.S. government officials advocating, uh, which was not really done in the past. And it's because we understand how important it is. Again, some of it is bridging gaps that we have in production, but a lot of it is we, it, it is good for the overall U.S. economy, it's good for jobs, it's good for our technology development. So there's a lot of different aspects to the export uh, issue, but I, I think we're making progress. Frankly, not as much as we should be making, uh, but we're making progress. Uh, there's a question here about the S2T2 methodology and whether it is, uh, whether it, it is in fact, as it uh, appears to be based mostly on uh, physical sites and capacity. And uh, the question is really about what's the human capital component right. of it. Um, you addressed that a little bit, but so, yeah. uh, you can repeat that more fully. Yeah, so S2T2, again, is a, it's, a, it's a process. But what everyone is familiar with is the S2T2 surveys, right? That's one of, I think, seven components of the overall project. But it is the one that everyone hears about because they're the ones that you have to, you know, companies fill out for us. And that is very much physically uh, a physical uh, exercise. What's your capital equipment? And if you've seen the surveys, one of the questions we ask is, who are your top ten suppliers, and how, you know, how, uh, what do they supply, and, and do you think they're vulnerable? Then we go to those ten. We say, what are your top ten suppliers? And that's how we bridge. The, that's how we understand these these matrix going down. The human uh, dimension of it is handled uh, differently, and and I'll give you a, a good example. Uh, but it, within the same context, because it's, uh, it, and this again is particularly of interest to folks like Mr. Kendall or Dr. Carter, is the design team capability. Uh, so, you know, I, I use uh, 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 contact fuses. I mean, we, we, there aren't that many people who really still know how to do that. In fact, one of the, uh, I guess, fathers of that, that sector recently passed away. So we lose human capital, and we're losing it all the time. And, and so we need to identify those human capital resources that we need. In the case of the next generation bomber, uh, the decision was made to, uh, to terminate that program of record, but there was a conscious decision that was made to continue to invest in the design teams and the intellectual capability of all of the, uh, all of the, uh, uh, the companies that were participating at that time. That is now providing huge dividends as we go into the next generation system uh, because that intellectual capital uh, was kept together and they're now putting together uh, proposals that we would not have had had we not made that investment up front uh, to sustain the human capital. So I don't, nobody should take away from the S2T2 effort that it's about loading docks and facilities. It, there's a, a very significant degree of, of, of human capital and design teams. And I think you'll see in the coming months uh, even greater emphasis on keeping design teams in place uh, even if that means we may not be manufacturing certain things uh, because we can't afford it. But you'll, you'll see a, a, a significant emphasis on, on human capital. And how do you deal with that on the, um, some of the less uh, engineering type skill sets, but um, some of the maintenance unique maintenance skill sets for Absolutely. materials well, and things like that. I, I remember I did, uh, I don't know how long ago it was, it, somebody in the room will know, but I was asked to do an, a study of the industrial base for the B2, uh, I think it was probably 15 years ago when it was coming out. And what, what shocked me when, in doing the analysis was um, the, 
one of the key folks that nobody, you know, everyone thought about the, the receivers and the stealth plates and all that. It was, it was the person on the, on the line smoothing the edges before the plane took off, uh, which was a real skill, largely taken, frankly, from the automotive. These guys were mostly automotive uh, detailers. Uh, that was an irreplaceable skill. Uh, and it, it wouldn't be something you would normally think of. Uh, but that maintenance, that repair, that capability is essential and it factors into everything we do. That's, we're trying to understand better, not just on the budgetary side, the life cycle costs, but how do you get sustainment, how do you quantify sustainment, and then what parts of, in the sustainment cha uh, tail do you need to ensure we have the, the capacity to, to address uh, for throughout the life of the program? Okay, there are a couple of questions to merge here regarding emerging technology and diversity, the uh, how emerging technology like the 3D printing ah, yes. can uh, improve the contractor diversity, but there's also the advances in composite materials, the, the fabrication that uh, might be beyond uh, single companies, small, you know, so how do you go for the diversity but also have right. the emerging? Well, I, I'd say w one of the great privileges I've had uh, in, in the office is we were asked by the White House uh, to sponsor the first uh, NNMI project, the National Technology Project that, that we announced in, in Youngstown back in August, which was on adaptive manufacturing, basically 3D printing. The president had it in his inaugural address. He again said it as his first item in the inaugural address, this idea of building these institutes, these public-private partnerships. The department, we put in $30 million. We had it matched with $45 million from the leading companies. Northrop Grumman's one of the uh, key sponsors of that Youngstown uh, effort uh, for adaptive manufacturing. And it truly is, you know, my, I'm not R&E, so I'm manufacturing. So my, what I uh, constantly instill on my folks is, unless it has a loading dock, we're not interested in putting money into it. It has to have a loading dock. Something has to be coming out of that factory. Um, and, and it, but those we're going to, and, and you will see in the near future, we're going to announce some more. And DOD is again going to take the lead on that uh, uh, for, for the administration. Uh, uh, we are very excited about those institutes. And they, some of them, they're, ba you know, the, the broad concept is what the Fraunhofer Institutes were in Germany. But this is much more narrow, much more defined. My goal is to get the Department of Defense out of that business, stand them up, uh, get them going. And if they can't make it commercially, then let's shut them off. They, they shouldn't be institutes in perpetuity, but they're important skill sets. Imagine, if you will, uh, and we're not terribly far away, a ship under sail that doesn't carry spare parts, that just carries CAD CAM and then makes them. Uh, uh, imagine uh, uh, troops that are able to uh, manufacture even munitions on site in theater. That's what adaptive manufacturing is bringing to us, that, that promise of that capability. Um, and at the same time, it has huge residual effects for the overall U.S. economy. Uh, it will make us competitive. As, as we've said it, uh, before, we should not expect to be competitive in this, in this global marketplace by making T-shirts. That's not what we do well anymore. What we do well is have high-skilled, high-wage labor that does things like adaptive manufacturing and 3D printing. And I know there's a lot of focus that we have on protecting our intellectual property, which is obviously very important. My focus in my office and what I've stressed to our folks is I want to continue to be able to create things that people want to steal. Uh, that should be our goal. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that's what we're doing with the manufacturing initiatives and particularly the adaptive manufacturing and several others that you'll see probably in the next week or so uh, that will be announced. Uh, let me follow up a little bit on that with the question that I have about whether there's any prospect of expanding Mantech in that context and then a, a, another one uh, related to a question that David asked on um, the reauthorization of the DPA and whether um, you see opportunities to expand it uh, and or things that you'd like to see done differently in the reauthorization next year. Well, the, so uh, I think DP, DPA is one of those jewels of the federal government that I don't like to talk about because I don't like to bring attention to it because it works so well now that uh, I'm worried that if it gets a lot Sorry, of attention, it'll stop. Yeah, it'll, it'll stop working. <laughs> But it's basically the authorities, uh, you know, it's the loading dock. It, you know, we don't invest in engineering, but we're, we're allowed under Title III, we're allowed to build facilities, actually build factories. And, and it has to have, you have to have two criteria in essence from the 1950 law, which is that it's, it's a national security imperative and it's not being met by commercial uh, need right now. 
but the, the goal has always been to invest in programs uh, that where we can build capacity and then again it has commercial benefit, uh, whether those are you know, 50,000 ton presses uh, or, or whether they're beryllium plants or facilities, things that we need that otherwise uh, is not being met by the commercial market. Uh, it is coming up for reauthorization. There are the, people wonder why, uh, you know, there's only one, three, and seven of the article. This is the other two were over, I think two were overturned by the Supreme Court under Truman when he tried to do the steel industry, right? He tried to, uh, so there are only three left and we, uh, our, our group has the, all three of them. Uh, we don't, we're not looking for anything really new. Uh, we like the idea that it's no year, no color money. Uh, in the last authorization in 09, they've set up something called the Defense Production Act Committee which is uh, an all of government committee. So it's all the deputies from all the departments get together and we prioritize uh, among all of us uh, where investments should be made on behalf of the government that can, um, uh, that can best be used uh, for our own purposes, for the government's purposes, but also to generate uh, uh, more effective uh, US economic uh, competition internationally. So I think it's working pretty well right now. I'm, I'm hopeful that it doesn't get, um, uh, doesn't get changed uh, too much. Uh, so far, it's been effective. Okay, the topic is BBP 2.0. Frank Kendall just published Implementing Directive BBP 2.0. I have, have it tattooed. I, I tattooed it right there. <laughs> <laughs> all 36 all pages, 36 pages all 36 of it. Yeah. Initiatives. Yeah. Absent small. from the guidance are metrics to measure the effectiveness or cost of the various initiatives. They want to know why oh, those are missing. That's, that's a very, uh, I'll go back, that's a very interesting take on it. It, it, it. I will say that with Mr. Kindle, for those of you who know him, and he has this great quote on the outside of his door that uh, in God we trust, everyone else has to bring data. Um, uh, that That is an assumed part of everything we, we did in 2.0. And I can tell you how many Saturdays and Sundays walking through each of those initiatives and and and, and how we were going to measure internally the differences. And there are metrics associated with each one of them, but it's an interesting point that that doesn't come across in the, in the rollout. And so that, that's a great point, and I will, we should be more explicit, but I assure you there are uh, very explicit metrics because you have to know what you're doing better, and that's the whole point of when we issue Better Buying Power 3.0, we will base it largely both on the industry input, the input from our internal folks, but also on how we, how we did with the metrics. And some will drop out and some will have to uh, accelerate, but we'll, we'll make a better point of, of making that clear over the coming days. We're gonna have a couple of events uh, that'll be rolling that out and I'll make sure that's addressed in the, in the events. If I could add one thing to that as well, this is a subject that we've tracked pretty closely at CSIS since actually the initial Better Buying Power initiative that, uh, that Dr. Carter put out when he was under secretary. Right. And, uh, and we'll continue to track and report on that independent of um, your own assessment of how your progress as well. So. I'm sure yours will be much better <laughs> than ours. <laughs> it may not be quite as many facts and figures in it, and it certainly won't involve tattoos. Right, right. good, uh, good. That's good to hear. Um, a question about, you talked about how you are getting more integrally involved in um, the processes of the department. Uh, there's one here about whether you've yet cracked the code on getting into reprogramming decisions or not. Uh, I, you know, I can't talk much about budgets, but the general answer is yes. Uh, uh, you know, we have a, a series of very senior level uh, working groups. Uh, you know, there's the DMAG, there's the SCRIM, there's the, I, I can't even keep, you know, that's the other arm I have them all tattooed on. But they, we, we, we are involved in that, uh, from that perspective, I will, I will say that we, twice now, uh, we have presented to the DMAG, the, the, the leadership, uh, if you will, the, the four stars and, and COCOMs, on just solely on industrial base uh, issues. And, uh, and there were uh, some reprogramming discussions in there uh, about things we needed to adjust or move around. And um, uh, but again, the, you'll see those coming out, but I, I just assure you that we, we are asked to comment. It doesn't mean we always get what we want, uh, but they are at least, they're on the table. The discussions are on the table. I think we've got time for one last question and then uh, we'll wrap up. Okay. Okay, final question is, what is the role of broader U.S. policies on manufacturing for preserving the defense industrial base? 
Well, like I said, the manufacturing part is, uh, anyone who's read the recent uh, Time Magazine article, the cover story is, is U.S. Manufacturing Back? I'd encourage you to read that. It talks a lot about the initiatives the department has, has taken on there. It's a priority, I know uh, personally, uh, of the president, uh, Dean Sperling and the NEC, and it certainly has been a priority of uh, all three secretaries I've been able to work with, um, uh, that we need to build stuff here, and we need to build really good stuff here. And uh, even though our base is more global in the supply chain, it's more commercial, we still have to have that industrial capacity. And at the end of the day, if you think about what's unique about defense, uh, that it sets it apart from every other government agency, is that we, we think about something, we design it, uh, we create it, we buy it, we use it, and then we maintain it. There's not a single other federal agency that does all of that. And so from the very creation to the 30 you know, ship that goes into mothballs 50 years later, we have a responsibility to be able to man manufacture and, and, and to support that entire supply chain. So it's a unique responsibility for us. And it's one that's identified uh, through programs like the Defense Production Act and Mantech, but it's also recognized, I think, by the overall administration and the government to give us support that when we do need manufacturing capability here in the U.S., whether it's, um, uh, whether it's uh, foundries for certain types of advanced uh, technologies that we're concerned about or whether it's a shipyard, we're going to maintain those here in the U.S. Uh, no matter what. And there will be a cost associated to that, but that's a commitment that we have to have because we have to be able to support the warfighter to execute the mission. Well, Mr. Secretary, we've been delighted to have you here this afternoon. I've, uh, uh, I've been a student of the Industrial Policy Office over the years uh, <laughs> in DOD, and they tend to, it tends to swing between two pillars, if you will. Pillar number one is we don't do industrial policy because that involves having the government intervene in the marketplace, and it's against our philosophy to do that. Pillar number two is we don't have to worry about the industrial base because given enough time and enough money, we can always recover from whatever errors we commit. Uh, you, it seems, have actually strived to create a third alternative, one which has both analysis at its core and some rationality and focus as its objective here. And so I think we thank you both for your appearance here this afternoon and for your service there. Um, uh, please join me in a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is much nicer than my office. <laughs>